Varsågod, Bill Hansson. Tack, Håkan. Um, I will do this in English because I have uh, several colleagues here who are not Swedish spoken. Uh, I want to start by just uh, sometimes you, you get fascinated by how, how similar backgrounds can go different ways, but keeping the same interest. So when Roland gave his talk, he more or less described my childhood as well. Uh, it's exactly the fascination of nature. Uh, and, and it actually came up, I gave a radio interview recently, and in, uh, in the newspaper or in, on the web it looked like this. It says, Bill Hansson collected corpses on the lawn at home. Um, it meant that all those injured animals that didn't make it uh, after our care, they were all dissected on the lawn and all cats were skinned and the skins were dried and put in the ceiling of my boy room. And I always wondered why I never got any girlfriends. Uh, <coughs> finally, I met my wife, who is very tolerant. Um, so uh, from there, I want to go back to, to the scientific part. And uh, I just want to start mentioning the organization that I work in right now. And then I will come back to SLU uh, towards uh, the, the later half of my talk. So I work in the Max Planck Society. This is a society now about 25,000 people working there. We have about 3,500 students, about 2,500 postdocs. Um, yearly budgets of about 1.7 billion euros. Pure research. And recently we produced a 75 second little movie about how we think. And, and uh, I want to show that to you now. Knowledge is everything. But have you ever wondered where knowledge comes from? Most fundamental discoveries result from years of investigations driven by curiosity, not merely application. First, you have to push the frontiers of knowledge to understand where you're heading. This is the mission of the Max Planck Society. And for us, it's the people who matter. We hire the best scientists worldwide who are on a quest to solve the really big questions in science. And we give them everything they need to pursue their mission. Small but effective think tanks, the best team members from all corners of science, high-end lab equipment, and two more special ingredients, time and trust. After all, basic researchers are on a risky endeavor. But if they succeed, after many years of hard work, they may open the door to an unimaginable new world of understanding and possible applications. That's how the knowledge of tomorrow is produced. Become a pioneer in science as well, and join us at the Max Planck Society. Remember, knowledge can light up the world. So that's a, a short take on, on what we try to do. So we're pure basic science. We hire people from all over the world. We hope we get the best ones, and then we give them lifelong trust and financing. So you get the rest of your career financed by about 2 million euros per year, and you can really pursue what you want to do. Okay, so now I want to go back to my, my scientific part. So, so why do I work with insects at all? Well, if you look at insects, they, today we estimate that there is about 5.5 million species of insects out there. That makes up 80% of all animal species on Earth. This means that insects, they are the most prosperous order of any animal on Earth. Quite amazing. Uh, they are extremely important for both health and welfare for us, right? So, so they are harmful because they eat up what we, we want to grow. They eat up what we store in, a, in our barns. Uh, they are also very important disease vectors, spreading malaria. Today we know Zika, for instance, very much uh, on the agenda. But they're also beneficial, as we heard before. I mean, they provide pollination services. They yield useful products like honey or silk. And they prey on other harmful organisms, often other insects, those pests that we talked about before. They're also very favorable experimental models. We can understand a lot about many different mechanisms by looking at the insect. We can understand a lot about evolutionary relationships. I always say that uh, it's, it's pretty boring being a human, right? Because we don't have anyone around us. L look out in your bird feeder in the, in the winter time. You put out the seeds and there are maybe 20 species out there. And they're very similar. They're, 
the Taljuks and Blomes and the Domherre and the other guys, and they're all about the same size and they can interact. But we don't have any Neanderthals or any other human species running around with us. So it's very hard to do those evolutionary studies with us. With insects, it's even better. So there are maybe thousand species of Drosophila fruit flies, for instance. That means that we can look at how all these different species adapted to the specific ecological niche where they live. So you can really do a lot of experiments and a lot of studies to understand how did evolution take place and how did it form different kinds of systems. You can also compare them, of course. How does one insect function with another one? And they're also really important today for building robots. We're really using the insect architecture to build biologically inspired robots, like robot cockroaches that can run in under the debris after an earthquake and find the humans lying under there, or flying little insect robots to go around and find landmines or something like that. So, so they're really used to build robots as well. And then on top of that, they're of course absolutely amazing creatures. I wasn't really so interested in insects as a kid. I was interested in, in foxes or badgers or elephants and lions, and I thought I would work with that uh, as I was going to be a scientist. But then Jan Lövqvist, my old supervisor, he came up with a PhD position looking at insects, and since then I'm totally sold. Uh, I mean, they are there. You look at them here. I mean, they, we looked at the art before. Nature is art. <laughs> uh, it's, it's colors. Uh, look at all. Look, look at the front end there as well, because that's where we will go soon. That's the, that's the nose of the insects. That's what they used to smell and find their way around. Here is also a, b a better view on, on the olfactory system. But, but we will go back and look at that more. You, you can read more in this review that we wrote a couple of years back if you want to understand more about them. So why smell? That's where I will go. I'm really interested in the sense of smell. So we talked about insects. Why smell? Well, <laughs> insects are to a very great extent smell driven. They find what they want to find by smelling their way. So they find who they want to mate with. They find what they want to eat. They find where they want to lay their eggs. These are the three major things that an insect needs to do during his or her life. And, and that they do to a very great extent with their sense of smell. It's also highly interesting to look at their system of smell because it's evolutionarily conserved. So it looks very similar in an insect as it does in your nose and in your brain. Now, not so much has changed and we can draw very general conclusions from looking at the insect. And then, of course, we can use their sense of smell, as they are so dependent on it, we can use it to manipulate their behavior. We can steer them away from where we don't want them. We can attract them to where we want them. We can get, them, uh, get the bark beetle away from the spruce and get the bees into the uh, almond groves or, or wherever we want to have them. And on top of that, smell is amazing. The sense of smell, you might not notice, but it's your most exquisite sense. If you look at your visual sense, you see everything around here, the orange there, the red, the white, the brown, with three kinds of receptors, right? Red, blue, and green. That's all you need to see everything around you. But to smell, you, n you have 300 receptors. It's actually your largest family of receptors in your whole body. And that's only to smell. Why is that? Well, it's because the sense of smell and olfaction is a multi-dimensional space. Huh? What does it mean? Seeing is all one wavelength. It's all red, blue, green. It's the same kind of stimulus, just going fast or going slow. Hearing is different wavelengths, fast or slow. But smelling, every new molecule is unique out there. So in this room, there are millions of molecules. Not one is identical to the other one if they are different, right? So, so that means that to have a sense of smell, you need to build receptors for all of this. So we have 300 in our nose. The, the organism that has the most is the elephant with about 2,000. And, and by combining all of these receptors in different patterns, it's like playing a piano, right? So by combining them in different patterns, you can smell millions of odors. But you can only do it by having so many, otherwise it wouldn't work. Okay, so here is a, a view on the sense of smell. Here, here is the insect to the left, 
uh, an insect has an external nose, that's the antenna. That means that they're smelling all the time. It's something to think about, that you are only smelling half the time. You have to go <laughs> to smell. And then you turn it off while you breathe out, while otherwise you would just smell what you have in your lungs. So, so, but they smell 100% of the time because they're flying around like this, right? On their antenna are these little hairs. Each little hair, thousands, 200,000 maybe on, an, on a moth like this, each one is really a little nose because it's a confined environment with snot in it. Just like you have snot in your nose, you couldn't never really leave the ocean because you're, in your nose the nerves hang out in the environment. It's the only place on your body where nerves are actually hanging, dangling out in the environment, right? But they're dangling out in salt water, which is the snot in your nose. But that's also why nerves in your nose only live for about 14 days. It's constant turnover. It's the place in your nervous system where you have the fastest turnover in any kind of way. And also coming from the inside. So there are constantly nerves growing like this and meeting each other. Next problem, they must meet the right one because otherwise you might see a rose and you might smell something totally different. So they have to meet in the right place. Very strong problem, but I will not go into that today. Here is the mouse Harvey. Harvey was built from a single olfactory neuron. So uh, that, that's another problem as well. But the, the, actually, a neuron was taken and put into an egg. And that shows that also an olfactory neuron is totally normal and can build, has the competence of building a fully functional new individual. So Harvey was built from an olfactory neuron. But in his nose, and in your nose, the same kind of receptors are picking up molecules. So these are the receptors that you have in your nose, 300 of them to smell. Okay, let's go on. Here is the head of a fruit fly. This is our main, or we have two main model organisms, I would say. But Drosophila is known from before, you know, the genetics, all the classical studies starting in the early 1900s. All the blue parts here are the smelling parts. That's the antenna. These are the palps, all with these kinds of hairs. So what does a fruit fly face? Fruit flies have to find the right stage of fruit where yeast is present that they can eat. They live from yeast. They are really not banana flies or fruit flies. They are yeast flies. So look at this. I mean, all these apples lying there. In there, the fly has to find the perfect apple. It should have some yeast growing on it, but it shouldn't be on the verge of totally decaying and falling together because then the larva will die. So with its olfactory scent, it is able to judge where do I have the perfect stage of yeast, go there and dump the eggs or go there and eat. So we are always looking at this from a point of behavior. So many classical studies were always done with genetics, or chemistry, biochemistry, molecular methods. We start from the other side. We start from the ecology. We, we think that also a fly is really an animal. It's not just a flying test tube. You have to think like a fly to go onwards with this. And that has become our niche in these kind of studies. So basically we are interested in what is good and what is bad which means where should you go and where should you stop? And how is that coded in the brain? Because that's what olfaction is a lot about, right? When you open your fridge and your two week old dinner is standing in there and you go, Ugh, that's the clear stop signal, right? When you're hungry and you go up here for lunch and you smell the, the cod back or whatever we got for lunch, that's when you want to go there and eat, right? So we started looking at this, and our, our first hit, so, so to say, was that we found a red line through the whole system of the fruit fly. And this is a stop signal. So when this thing presses that button, it means full stop. How it can smell as nice as possible out there, but when a few molecules of geosmin occur. Geosmin is produced by the microorganisms on this orange. So this is a good example where it has gone too far, right? The yeast is there, but then on top of the yeast, we got this streptomyces or penicillium, and that is highly toxic to the fly. So she shouldn't go there anymore. And that produces geosmin. Geosmin is the odor of corked wine or of newly plowed fields in the spring or of an old cellar. We are really sensitive to this odor as well. But here, when this, if, if we activate these neurons artificially. You can do that in the fly. 
So instead of having the olfactory receptor, you put a light receptor into those same neurons. You blow blue, blue light onto those receptors, the fly will go like this, because she thinks that it smells geosmin, but we are really using blue light, but we're activating the same neurons. And by doing that, we can show that this red line means one thing, and it goes straight through the system. That makes also interesting things. If we could find such a line in the mosquito and activate it, then we would have the mosquitoes stopping before they were finding us. So. Next thing we looked at was limonene. That's, that's a very good odor for the fly. It's produced in the rind of, of uh, oranges or lemons, and it makes the woman, the female, drop her eggs. So as soon if you activate these neurons artificially, the female will lay her eggs. So it's again, it's one red line through the system, only saying one thing, lay your eggs when you pick up these molecules. Another one is about antioxidants. That's when the fly is really attracted to something, to find the best food available. And the best food is this kind of yeast that we also use to make beer, Brettanomyces. It smells absolutely exquisite to the fly and it's so attracted. And if you activate these receptors, the fly will run like crazy to get there. And the final one, another bad one that I want to mention that we actually found last year, that is where the fly smells an enemy. So this is the worst enemy of the fly. It's a parasitoid and it lays its eggs into those larvae. So of course the fly wants to stay away from this guy because 80% of the larvae are parasitized in nature. So if the female fly can smell that there are parasitoids around, she should go away. And what she, during evolution, has learned to do is to smell the sex pheromone of these guys. So, of course, that's very smart because it's very hard to stop using your sex odor because then you will not meet your mate. So, actually, Drosophila and the larvae make use of the sex communication of these guys to stay away from them. Also, a red line. If you activate it, the fly will go away. Interestingly, if you go higher up in the brain, the first bad odor that I showed you Geosmin and this bad odor, they target exactly the same place. And that is probably the bad place of the brain. So when this place is activated, it means stay away, don't go there, bad stuff. So now I want to go over to moths. That is our other, uh, our other model organisms. Here comes a, a, a moth flying. Watch the tongue and, and watch how skillfully this moth inserts its long, long tongue into this flower to extract the nectar that is in there. Beautiful. Huh? It's, a, it's really a wonder of nature. And, and if, if you look at that, then you can also see why Darwin was fascinated by this. Because if you, if you look at tobacco flowers, there is a whole range from this short one to these long ones. And what Darwin said was that there has been an amazing co-evolution of the moth with the length. So there are moths with these long tongues and there are moths with these long tongues. And the one with the short one will of course never reach the bottom of the long one. So there has been an amazing co-evolution of this. And, and what we found here is that there is actually one flower that matches the length of the moth tongue very well. So we started looking at these different flowers and especially of that one as, of course. And, and what we could show is that there is really an, an odor mixture that also shows the, the moth that this is the place you should go. All the flowers are white, so, so she cannot really see the difference between them, but she can smell the difference. So if we only take the odor and put it in the wind tunnel where we do the experiments, she will choose the right one based on the odor. But then what we went on was to measure the energy that it takes the moth to extract something out of there. She wants the honey, of course, right? So we measured the, en the energy by measuring CO2, and then we could show that the only flower where the moth actually get a positive energy budget, that is this one. All the other ones, she loses energy because it spends so much time hovering around there, either with a short, too short tongue or too long tongue, that she, can, uh, she will not get energy back from this interaction. So only the right flower with the right odor will pay off to spend time at. So this came out uh, just recently in Nature Communications, so you can read more about it there if you want to. Then I want to say, show one more moth thing, and, and this is, we call it smelling with your tongue. So normally you don't think that your tongue is with the organ that you would smell with, it's, it's your nose, right? 
But we started collaborating with my colleague at our institute, Ian Baldwin. Ian Baldwin has just like Detlef talked about before, he works a lot with molecular methods in plants. And he has constructed a tobacco plant where he has taken away the flower odor. So it's a totally normal plant, but there is no benzyl acetone, which is the major smell of these flowers anymore. Totally normal otherwise. Then we did experiments, and what we saw was that the moth found the flowers totally normally from the color, but the flowers were not pollinated, and there was no nectar extracted. So how, how did that all come together? What happened there? Some other sensory input was missing in the interaction. So we started thinking, what could be involved? So we, we took some pictures of the tongue, of the proboscis of the moth, this long thing. And what we saw there at the tip was that there were these typical structures that we know are involved with olfaction. So the, hmm, do they smell with their tongue? Really? So we started looking at this more in detail. We started doing electrophysiology, inserting small electrode into these structures, micro, and, and looking at how it works. And what we found was that there are indeed olfactory cells on th in the tip of the tongue smelling exactly the flower odors that are around. So the moth is smelling with its tongue. So how could we test this? Now I have a very smart graduate student. He said we should, because the, it also has the same, same receptors on the antenna, but we wanted to show that it was really the tongue that was playing the major part here. So, so what he, he said, we, we build this tiny, tiny little Y tube, and then we have odor here and nothing there, and then we suck out the odor before it can reach the antenna. In this way, we will see if the moth is really going for this, right? So uh, now this one never works the first time, but magically it works the second time. So it just had to run. But what I will show you here is that how the tongue moves. Here we go. Uh, so we run it again. Mm, there, wait, wait, we go back. And we go on. There, now it works. I don't know why. Uh, so you will see that the, the, the red part there, that's where the odor is. And, and there it tried the other way, but that wasn't good. So it keeps putting its tongue into the direction where only the odor is present. And what we could then show statistically was that it, it puts its tongue into the side where the odor is all the time. So it's for the first time, I think, ever that it has been shown that, uh, that someone smells with its tongue. So that was uh, this very good student, Alexander Hafferkamp, and we published it to Detlef's Joy in, uh, in eLife uh, just this year. And we're, we're very happy about that. So there, there you can read more about this. Okay. So now I want to move down to Alnap. Alnap is the southern campus of, of SLU, and that's uh, where I have worked together with my very good colleagues in the Linnaeus program. So, so just when I left 2006, we got a grant. So we, together we applied for money and we got a 10-year grant with about 9 million crowns, 1 million euros per year to go on doing our science. And it was quite unique because normally people only got these grants if you were one group in, uh, in Umeå and one in Lund and so on. But with us, they sort of saw that there was some potential to, to strengthen an, an already good environment. So th these were the people that were involved in those days. So we, we started with this, and, and I want to give you some examples of, of what we were doing. The title was this, Insect Chemical Ecology, Ethology and Evolution. So how do insects behave overall towards uh, chemistry? And we wanted more or less to know how it can change over time, over very short times or over very long times. This is what we looked, uh, we looked like now in the end here. Really many nationalities, a lot of people in there, both men and women working in there and so on and so forth. Um, so some examples. One thing that we found, which is also very relevant, I think, to, to the applied side, is that insects really change their behavior dependent on if they're mated or not. So this is a, a virgin female. What does she like? She likes the odor of flowers. She wants to feed because she's not mated. So she will all the time fly to the purple part here in the wind tunnel. Then we mated her, and then we did the same experiments again. And what happens? She totally disregards the flower. And now she only goes for the green odor because she wants to find nice juicy leaves where she can put her eggs. So a total <coughs> swap in the head. I mean, it's like if you are hungry or not, or if you just mated or not, you will have different preferences for your next action, right? 
So what we could then see also when we went into the brain of the moth, so we opened up the head of the moth and there we put a calcium indicator. A calcium indicator shows where things are activated. And the only thing you have to worry about here is that here is more activity than here and here is more activity than here. So the behavior is mimicked by how the brain works. So things detecting the flower were down-regulated after mating, and things detecting the green odors from the leaf were up-regulated at that time. Okay, another one. Where do you lay your eggs? So we have different kinds of, uh, of plants where this moth can lay its eggs. And if you look at the preference, it's like this. So it really likes the, some kind of bean on top, then clover, mice, uh, cotton, and it really hates cabbage, as everyone else. Uh, so what we did was that we then fed the moth with cotton. And what we could show is that the whole, then it preferred suddenly to lay its egg on cotton. So the whole system is flexible and can change according to what you experienced as a kid. So if you were, if you were brought up, only cabbage we could not uh, change. Cabbage was always bad. But all the other ones we could shift around like this depending on what we fed the moth. This last example, this is actually Frederick Schluter's uh, project sitting up there. Uh, this is about uh, production forest and goes to the, to the forest side of those of you sitting here. What, what Frederick and his colleagues could show was that uh, it's really not good to have a forest like this. This is a monoculture, right? It's much better to have a forest like this because some of these odors from the green leaves there, they are really bad for the bark beetle. And the bark beetle and other forest insects, they have put special sensors on the antenna to tell them, I shouldn't go there because it smells birch. So if you, put, if you let some birch or some other uh, deciduous uh, trees stay among the, among the spruce, then your forest is much safer against attack than if you didn't have that. And, and this, is really w this is really functional, and, and you can do it chemically as well. And, and uh, we, we now practice it in, uh, in our for own forest in Småland to try to make much more mixed stands of, of trees. Then last, uh, it also works in mosquitoes. I mean, this is one of our other projects in Olnop. And just a couple of weeks back, we saw this all over the news. Going to Florida, bring a chicken, because they got Zika in Florida, right? And, and it was all over the place. And what Ricard Ignell and his, his colleagues could show was that if you put a chicken here at the bed net together with the mosquito trap, you will catch no mosquitoes. So here are the results. You see, this is what you get otherwise. This is what you get when the chicken is there. So if you go into the forest, have a chicken under your arm, and you will get no mosquito bites. That's the basic take-home message. Of course, this is now do being done uh, synthetically to find those compounds so that we can use them in the future and get away from DEET, which is probably cancerogenous and so on. Okay, so the Linnea spirit continues. The project ended now in June, but the people are there and we really hope and I will uh, for sure stay connected to, to our program. I wa also want to mention my SLU years. This is Jan Lerkvist who started chemical ecology from the beginning, together with Gunnar Bergström, together with Jan Pettersson. But if you look at Jan and, and what came out of his activities, there is now one group in Lund with about 30, 40, people. There is one group in Olnap with 40, 50 people. There is one group in Jena with 60 people. And that all springs from this man and his colleagues' ideas from the beginning. So, so all honor to Jan. Um, I also want to bring up the good old days when we formed the faculty in, in Olnap. I learned so much from this that I use today, every day, from uh, how, how you run a place, how you organize a place, how, how you work with your colleagues, how you drink with your colleagues. And, and uh, I must say, I really enjoyed that time. Thank you, Roland. You, you are here in the audience. And also thank to the Linnea Group. This is our final meeting last week in Palm Beach, Florida, uh, which is now being blown away by the Hurricane Matthew as we sit here. So we were lucky to get out. But this was also an amazing time. We collaborated really well, and I think the Linnaeus program paid off in a, in a, in a very good way. So with that, uh, thanks to the people who did the job in my group in Jena, my group leaders who, who I totally depend on in my new function as vice president because I'm only there about two days a month, and they do the job, and we talk to each other over Skype. 
thanks to Max Planck, who uh, supplies all the funds, just like Detlef said before. It's an amazing opportunity. You never have to worry about money or grants. You just get the money on the bank. And uh, thanks to the people again, these are the two who did the studies, Ian Kesey and Alexander Hafferkamp that I showed you about before. And thank you, SLU, again, great honor. <laughs>